Turn, if you would, this morning to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. <laughs> start reading together in verse 8. We, we won't read the whole thing, but we'll read part of it. Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. <coughs> For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue night and uh, continue until night, till wine, wine, pardon me, wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, and the tambourine, the flute, and the wine are in their feasts. They do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of His hands. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he is jubilant and shall descend into it. <coughs> Prophet Isaiah lived in difficult times. And I wanted to talk today about the six woes for our age. He lived in difficult times. His nation, ancient Israel, was heading towards judgment from God because of their sins. Their rulers, both the civil rulers and their religious rulers, were corrupt. There was idolatry. There was sexual immorality. There was injustice that was rampant in the land. And the true religion which they had had become a mere formality for them. In Isaiah 1, verse 11, it says to, God says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, the lambs, or the goats. Of course, they required of the law to offer those to God. But he knew their heart was not right. And God considered ancient Israel to be his vineyard. In verse 7 of chapter 1, he says that. What do you do with a vineyard? You take care of it. You prune it. You, you cultivate it. You water it so it may produce a harvest. You know, some folks believe today that God is some little old bearded guy on a cloud up in the sky somewhere that just kind of bobbed his head around approvingly. Whatever thing, anything we do, he says, that's just fine, that's just fine. Well, you know, that, that's almost the way they were. That God was just far away and didn't really matter much. Well, you know, that view devalues the love of God. John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish and have everlasting life. It degenerates or denigrates, I can't talk today, denigrates, that's the word I wanted. It denigrates the view of the deity of God. He is not us. He is not man. But He does care very deeply about all of us. God is deeply concerned about our individual lives. He's concerned about the path that this nation is taking. In Daniel chapter 4, for example, God had had a, a interaction with a very idolatrous man named Nicodemus, uh, named, pardon me, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I had the end right anyway. Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar for a time had gone, I guess you would say, insane living like an animal. God had told him that because of his pride. And then he'd come back. God restored his sanity. And Nicodemus says something in those verses, especially in verse 17. He says, This decision is by decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the Holy One, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. That's an interesting verse, Daniel 4, verse 17. God and his angels, they're the watchers. I believe that's what that's talking about there. They are observing what we're doing in this nation. And God is in control of this world. 
Over two generations ago, our nation set out on a very lawless path. We rejected, to begin with, the God of the Bible for humanism. Which humanism is actually the making man the center of everything, not rather than God. I teach part-time American history out of Columbia State, as you know, and we this semester have just studied, finished studying the our country up until the time of the Civil War, actually a little farther than the Civil War. It's amazing how leaders of our country, from the very beginning, with almost out exception, there were a few, that were very religious men. And they quoted from the Bible, and they alluded to the Bible in their speeches over and over and over again. Today we don't see that as much because our nation has gotten away from the Bible. Many people have rejected correct reasoning, logic, common sense for emotionalism. When you talk about, about Christianity with some people, it'll be, they'll begin by saying, I feel or I think rather than what, God, what does God say. Many folks have rebelled against authority and the rule of law, making every man his own law. The book of Judges. There was no king in Israel and every man did what was, he thought was right in his own heart. We see that more and more in this country. Many people have spurned morality and personal responsibility for degeneracy and moral relativism. I read today that our vice president and his family are up in Aspen, Colorado on vacation. And uh, they apparently are living in this uh, house up there. And across the street, someone put up a big banner that said, Make America Gay Again with a rainbow flag. I think how untrue and how disrespectful to the Vice President of the United States to do that. A new generation is now in control, actually my generation, and it's, it's grounded in lawlessness rather than the Word of God. Genesis reminds me of Genesis Chapter 6, the world before the flood. It's called the antediluvian world. It said in verse 5, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. We haven't reached that point yet, I don't think, but we're getting there fast in this world. Americans need to be warned that there is a day of reckoning approaching from God. As Paul said in Galatians 7, 6, verse 7, talking about not just a nation, but all people, individuals. He said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Reap what you sow. And that's true in our own lives and true in our nation too. So this morning I wanted to see what the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to record these woes. There's six of them here. This was, remember, this was almost 2,700 years ago. How they apply today. The word woe means, means it's used as a denunciation. Woe unto you. To denounce something. So let's look at this a little bit this morning. And I believe he, the first couple of verses there, and starting in verse 8, he pronounces a woe to the fruit of only unholy ambition. Woe to those who join house to house. Reading here from New King James Version. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Israel had long ago gotten away from the law of Moses, which they were covenanted to obey from Mount Sinai, where the law was given, the Ten Commandments, and so forth, all the law. In Isaiah 1, verse 2, it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Notice God says, I have brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. They were even went so far, even went so far to covet each other's land. That's what it means there in the verse 8. How join house to house, land to land, field to field. 
they opposed a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. For example, the law of Moses told them every 50 years, any land that you have bought or any land that's been sold that say was an ancestral possession that went way back, then you need to return that land to the original owner. They didn't do that. I'm not saying we have to do that today. I'm saying they didn't do it. They didn't do that. It's called the year of Jubilee. They would force out the rightful owners of land. For example, in 1 Kings chapter 21, we read about uh, King Ahab. He coveted a man's vineyard. The man's name was Naboth. And he wanted to buy it. He wanted to turn it into a vegetable garden, of all things. And Naboth says, no, this is mine. This is my father's, forefather's land. I'm going to keep it. So through his wife Jezebel, actually Jezebel arranged all this, she arranged for Naboth to be discredited. False accusations said that he had blasphemed God and, and cursed the king and so forth. And they went outside, took him outside and executed him. And guess who got the land? Ahab did. God sends Elijah the prophet to Ahab in chapter 21 of 1 Kings in verse 9 and says, You shall speak to him, to Ahab. Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. And that prophecy was fulfilled a couple of years later. Exactly. God dealt with Ahab. The land contained large estates with many poor tenant farmers farming it. And some of them were so large, a team of oxen <clears throat> could not plow them all in one day. Well, what about our own age? Oh, well, that was a long time ago. Wasn't it? My friends, materialism clouds people's visions. We see the world through the lens of money and wealth. I look at the stock market, follow the stock market at once. Well, I don't have anything in it but I think it's intriguing to see what happens. One big thing now on the stock market is something called bitcoins. Bitcoins, which is about like Martian air money. <laughs> it's not, doesn't there. It's amazing. People, it's money that is not based on gold or silver or the fa good faith and credit of the government, like ours is, things like that. It's just, just kind of comes out of the air and they the price of bitcoins has gone up from a thousand dollars to I believe it was thirteen thousand dollars. All that is materialism. Amazing. You know God does not condemn healthy ambition and honest profits. He doesn't condemn any of that. But he does condemn greed and covetousness. Colossians three verse five he says, covetousness, wanting something that's not yours and, and to obtain it uh, if you don't deserve it, is idolatry. It's like worshiping an idol. And that's the way it is with many people. God's curse was on the land because of selfish ambition. They built these magnificent homes. Some of them were even inlaid in ivory. And they, he says, you know, someday those are going to be abandoned. Look in verse 9. Truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones, without inhabitants. They would decay, be under drought, pestilence. The land would be unproductive. Notice in verse 10, he says, said, uh, 10 acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. Now, a bath is not like we think of it. It's a volume, liquid volume. It meant eight, eight gallons. He says, one vineyard will produce eight gallons of wine. Pitiful. And then he says, a field... A homer of, of seed shall yield one ephah. Now, what's that? A homer was six bushels of, let's say, wheat or barley seed. You would plant those six bushels, you would receive a harvest of one bushel, an ephah. One bushel. And you know, God had told them that was going to happen. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 20. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its produce nor shall the trees, the land, yield their fruit. God says, I'll, I'll curse the land if you do that. You know, I, I wonder about that. Why would, why 
Will God send a curse upon our land? You know, my friends, in parts of the West, they are still in a bad drought. In California, there's a lot of problems. Agricultural land there, too. We that are the breadbasket of the world are used to be. How that's going to work out, I don't know. But woe unto those who do have that selfish ambition. Let's look at another woe here, starting in verse 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night till wine inflames them. Now, when the, word, the Bible uses the word wine here, it doesn't use it the way we do. They had different categories of wine. They had, they had, they had what we would consider grape juice. That's what most people drank. Then they had alcoholic wine. Uh, and it's that way in the New Testament too. It depends on the context in which the word was used. Now, the drinking of alcoholic wine had become an all-consuming passion with them. Notice what he says. <clears throat> Woe to them who rise early in the morning they may fall intoxicating drink, who continue until night till wine inflames them. Now, this was alcoholic wine. And they were rising early, not to work, but to drink. And they drank off and on until night. You know, this is very appropriate today. There's many folks who can go out tonight, as you say back home, tie one on another. And they lose all control. Drinking had become a sign of social acceptance. Look in verse 12. The harp and the strings, the tambourine, the flute, the wine are in their feast. They do not regard the work of the Lord nor consider the operation of his hand. Sensuous music added to the effect. It's not, you know, it's not a, uh, just a coincidence that you go into a, a bar or a lounge or a nightclub where they're serving alcohol, and what do they do? They have the music cranked up. Because it goes together, it, as it did back then. You know, I'm reminded how today in Christian worship, among many people, you see stuff that goes on that has nothing really to do with the Word of God or spirituality, unauthorized worship. And yet they try to pass that off. And what is it? It's entertainment. That's what it is. And you know, I read here in these verses, in verse 12 and so forth, this sounds just like a modern rock concert where you have all this loud, vibrating music. And guess how, what else goes along with that, folks? Often, drugs go along with that. Where there'd be methamphetamines or ecstasy or marijuana or whatever it is that goes along all with that. Because And, and what about wine? Is an alcohol a drug? Last time I saw ethyl alcohol was a drug. You know, in the Bible, it talks a lot, quite a bit about drinking as a work of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Paul says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and he lists several of them, and right at the end he says, drunkenness and reveling and the like, of which I tell you before, Angie, as I've told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, my friends, I'll say this, but what is the difference between a sober person and someone that's intoxicated? One drink. That's the difference. You can talk to a policeman out there, and he'll tell you that. One drink. And notice also this word that you don't hear much about. Reveling. What is that? It means to carouse, lascivious dancing and drinking. Well, what do people do on New Year's Eve? A lot of people, not everybody. They engage in reveling. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. My friends, the truth is that social drinking is often a filthy, vomit-filled mess. I've been around it. I say that because this time of year, it's so prevalent. Proverbs 23, verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? 
Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine, they would often mix wine uh, with spices and, and narcotics and things like that. And all of this excess was a symptom of a greater tragedy. Here we find in verse 13. Therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. They had, they had left God out of their thinking. They had no knowledge. Over in Isaiah chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, The ox knows its master, the donkey its master's crib. Israel does not know, my people do not consider. God's own people, his vineyard, as he called it, did not know him anymore. Hosea 4, verse 6, was really, really rich, written about ancient Israel. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, I also reject you from being priests to me. Now, what was their punishment for this? God would punish them. It would be horrible. They would go into captivity. There was two captivities in, mentioned in the Bible. One was the Assyrian captivity in 721 B.C. And then later, what we know is the Babylonian captivity in uh, 485, I believe, B.C. They'll go into captivity, a horrible thing, away from their homes. He said either that or, as he says in verse 14, Sheol will be their grave. Sheol, the grave, that's what the Sheol meant. Now, that's one more. Let's look at another one here this morning. Verse 18, 19. Get my papers turned around here. It says, Woe to those who draw captivity with cords of vanity, and sin as with a cart rope. They say, Let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come. Now, what we're talking about here in these two verses is the woe to those who are enslaved by sin. Ancient Israelites were so involved in idolatry and debauchery and drunkenness and everything that they, had, they carried those sins around like a heavy cart. You know, that's what sin is. Many people don't realize today sin is enslavement. It's enslavement. John 8, verse 34, the Lord said himself, Most surely I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Oh, but you will talk to those people. People, and they will say, Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not a sin. I'm free. I remember working in oil fields in West Texas. And uh, come in on Monday morning, those poor guys had really tied one on the night before, and they were they were hooing around, and, and they would say, "What'd you do?" Well, I, you know, I didn't say much. They say, "Well, we had a good time," <laughs> and I thought, "Yeah, you did, didn't you? <laughs> you looked like a, a a sack of wet rocks this morning," and yet they thought they were having a good time because sin is like that cart. Only the gospel can free us from the burden of sin. You know, in Romans chapter 7, Apostle Paul, I believe, was writing here about how he went from and became a Christian. When he was not a Christian, he was a Jew, and he became a Christian. And it says, and in that process, he mentions in verse 24, he says, Oh, wretched man I am, who will de deliver me from the body of death, this body of death, this sin? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, what was that consequence of that enslavement to sin? It was mockery of God. Look in verse 9, 19 rather. Let, us, let him, meaning God, make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. They did not believe that God would judge them. Oh, he's not going to do this. You just come on down and, and judge us. If you say you're going to, you prophets keep saying that. You know, many people today, they, when they're enslaved to sin, they mock God and His Word. They'll say, well, you know, the Bible's not inspired. Just a kind of a, a book of, of kind of good sayings and stuff like that. Other people mock the moral commandments of God. It doesn't mean anything to them. Men who are enslaved to religious error also mock God when they say, for example, they say, you know, you don't really have to be baptized to be saved. Or they ridicule the doctrine of, of, of one body, 
one church that Brother Dane's going to talk about tonight. They snicker at the need for the uh, for authority in worship. Oh, you don't need that. That's old fashioned. Colossians three verse seventeen says, "Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord." Woe unto the such people. Let's look at another one, verse twenty. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those, in other words, who are spiritually blind and deaf. They mock this mocking spirit gave way to confusion, to moral confusion, a spiritual blindness and deafness. And that's what happens, folks, when you disregard the Word of God. You become confused. Over in Isaiah chapter 6, interesting verse that the, Jesus quoted and also the apostles in their writings. He says, and uh, see, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, as I can move my finger here, it says, and he said, told Isaiah, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their eyes heavy, ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return and be healed. They could not distinguish between the error of their own ways and the standards that God has set down in His law that they were under. To them, sobriety, for example, was inferior to drinking. Moral purity and fidelity, faithfulness, gave way to sexual immorality and debauchery. God's religion seemed inferior to idolatry. Justice was replaced by injustice. You know, today people do the same thing. They forget God's standards that are well defined in the Bible and they get confused. And they become spiritually blind and deaf because no one on the day of judgment, I believe, can stand before God and say, well, you know, Lord, I didn't know that. I didn't have access to that because they did. Over in Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, Moses said, told them, says, For this commandment which I command you today, it is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. You know, on Wednesday nights we've been studying the book of uh, Judges, and we were reading how the children of Israel went through these cycles of apostasy, and then they would go back to God, and then back to apostasy, to idols again. That's all tied into Hebrews chapter 4, I think, where the writer of Hebrews points all this out, refers to that, and he says, For the word of God is living and powerful, quick and powerful, sharpening the two-edged sword, piercing even the vision of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. My friends, God's word is there for us to understand and apply to our lives just as it was back then. Now, we have a, a much better thing today. We have the gospel, which they didn't have. But it's there. But our society suffers today from that same moral confusion. I heard the other day where the state of Nebraska, now you get a license plate that says, says, my choice. It has Planned Parenthood underneath it. Abortion, my choice. You read that and you think, well, what about the baby's choice? which it will never be able to make. Sexual promiscuity is expected by people today. I told this um, Danny earlier, but uh, back many years ago when I went to college, there was a young man there. Um, his father was a missionary in Germany, West Germany. And he had got engaged to a young lady over there, German. They were both Christians. <clears throat> and before there, when there, before you go to marriage, you have to go to the doctor, get a physical examination. They went to the doctor, and the doctor got talking to him. He says, well, how long y'all live together? He, he says, well, we, we don't do that. And he said, he said, I don't believe you. You mean you, you don't know if it's going to work or not? You don't live together to find out if this is you're compatible and stuff? And they said, no, we're Christians. We don't do that. Our society has reached that same point today. That same point. Homosexuality is accepted by so many people today. It's incredible. 
something so condemned by the Word of God. And, that, well, it's amazing. We could go on about that. Lying and, and twisted ethics by so many people in positions that, that they know better. Some even within the body of Christ don't know the difference between sound doctrine and false teaching. False teachers often try to fog over the issue. But you know, preachers of the gospel and teachers have a very special responsibility. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17, For we are not as, some, as many peddling the word of God. 1 Timothy 6 verse 5, he says, Useless wranglings of men of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Talk about people who make money off religion, off of false doctrine. Woe unto them. Look in verse 21. It says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. In other words, woe to those who are self-deceived. You know, these people had mocked the Word of God and His prophets, and they were confused about what was, what was good and what was evil. They didn't know what was going on. Now they had become dependent upon their own human wisdom apart from God. And there is no true wisdom without God in His Word. There is no wisdom apart from God's Word. Book of Job, Job chapter 28. Job says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. In Romans 1 verse 22, Paul, speaking of his own age, he said, Professing themselves to be wise, they have become fools. In, for individuals and societies, there is no deception like self-deception. Think, I'm just fine. I'm just fine. I haven't murdered anybody today. I'm doing just fine. But they don't go to the Word of God. Romans 1 verse 28 even as they do not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. I heard on tonight, just had to mention this earlier, on CNN, they're going to have their annual countdown, you know, when the thing drops there in Times Square for uh, New Year's Eve. And they're going to have two men, or two men to do this. Both of them are gay. And the thing is, on the internet was, are they going to kiss each other at midnight? Well, I'm not going to turn on to find out, but shows you how pitiful. Woe unto those who are self-deceived. Finally this morning, in verses 22 and 23 of our text, it says, Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Isaiah's day was filled with unjust officials who took bribes. But instead of being skilled in finding out what justice was, judging people correctly, they were experts with alcohol. That's what they were experts with. And my friends, I've heard this said many times. In Washington, D.C., many laws are framed and worked out, compromises and, and things, passed, whatever, people drinking. That happens all the time. And yet, and probably judges too, for all I know. Hosea 4, verse 12, verse 11 and 12 speaks of this time. He says, Harlotry wine and new wine enslave the heart. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols and their staff, their diviner's rod, informs them. The spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray and they have played the heart against their God. Why was that? Because they had given up on God. They had given up on God. You know God is concerned about us, how we think and live our lives. And He will curse any land and I believe any individual who forgets Him and rebels against Him. God wants us all in this new year to return to the Bible because He knows what's best for us. I don't. I guarantee you, save us all 
I'm military, you don't either. But God knows what's best for you and I. There may be someone here this morning who can start out this new year as a Christian, being born again of the water and the Spirit. They need to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, John 8, verse 20, 24. To repent of their sins, at verse 30, as God commands. To confess Jesus as the Son of God before men, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. To be born again, water baptized in water for the remission of their sins, Acts 2, verse 30, to rise up to walk in newness of life, forgiven, the child of God. Or maybe someone who is as a Christian, they brought reproach on the church, they need to ask God's forgiveness and ask their brethren's forgiveness. If this is your need this morning, please come as we stand and sing. And so I will you linger wandering from the fold of God Give you not the invitation, oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, careless soul, oh, heed the warning, heed the warning. For your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. So thoughtless are you standing while the fleeting years go by, and your life is spent in folly. Oh, prepare to meet thy God, careless soul. Oh, careless soul. Oh, heed the warning. For your mind will soon be gone. Unprepared to meet thy God, careless souls, oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared.